case of Gabby Petito has garnered worldwide attention for a number of reasons, and it's not just missing white woman syndrome, where the media disproportionately covers missing person cases involving young, attractive, affluent white women. This case is special because individuals on social media have taken an active role in solving the case, in leading authorities to Gabby's body, and in putting together a timeline that, by itself, almost assuredly places at least some level of responsibility for her death on Brian Laundrie. So what proof do I have? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we are going to take a close look at the timeline and the available evidence connected to the disappearance and death of Gabby Petito and the disappearance and death of Brian Laundrie. Because what makes this case so interesting is the amount of audio and video documentation the logistical information about their journeys, including the travelogue post that they have, the 911 emergency call, police body cam footage of the domestic dispute, and the eyewitness accounts as to the whereabouts of these two that were made on various social media platforms. So we are going to walk through all of that and evaluate the available evidence to paint the story of these star-crossed lovers gone wrong. If you enjoy the episode, hit that like button for me. If you got a question, you got a comment, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed, smash that subscribe button so that you get all of the real crime episodes that come from this channel. And last but not least, as always, I love it when you guys share me on social media. So the story begins with Gabrielle Venora Petito, Gabby, who was born on March 19th of 1999 and raised in Blue Point, New York. She was the eldest of six siblings of a blended family. Petito graduated in 2017 from the Bayport Blue Point High School in Bayport, New York. It was there where she met Brian Christopher Laundrie. They began dating in March of 2019 and moved in together later that year with Laundrie's parents in Northport, Florida. The two then got engaged in July of 2020. During 2021, Petito had been saving money for a cross-country trip with Laundrie by working as a pharmacy technician in Florida. Gabby was described as being very close to her family, and on June 17th of 2021, they were both back home for her brother's graduation ceremony. On July 2nd of 2021, Brian and Gabby departed from New York in a white 2012 Ford Transit Connect van, converted to a camper for a four-month cross-country van-dwelling trip. They planned to travel to the West Coast and visit state and national parks across the western United States along the way. The couple planned to document the trip on Petito's YouTube channel as well as both of their Instagram accounts. The trip appeared to go as planned during the month of July. On July 4th and 5th, they were at the Monument Rocks in Kansas. On July 8th, they were in Colorado Springs, Colorado. On July 10th and 11th, they were at Grand Sand Dunes National Park, also in Colorado. July 16 through 18, they're at Zion National Park in Utah. July 21 and 22, they are at Bryce Canyon National Park, also in Utah. By July 26, they are at Mystic Hot Springs in Utah. July 30, Canyonlands National Park, Utah. And July 31, Mesa Arch, and that's within Canyonlands in Utah. 
From there, we don't really see any Instagram posts for about 10 days until August 12th when the two are at Arches National Park. And even though there are about 12 days between posts, it appears that they had spent a lot of time in this general area of eastern Utah because geographically the post on July 31 was only about 30 minutes away from the location of the post on August 12th. So it may very well be that these two were having relationship difficulties during this time period because we know that August 12th is also the date when they both had contact with law enforcement. And here's what we know about that day. On August 12th of 2021, a witness calls 911 claiming that a couple was fighting in the town of Moab, Utah, in front of the Moonflower Community Cooperative, a Whole Foods store there in the community. In the 911 audio recording provided by the Grand County Sheriff's Office, the caller tells the dispatcher he wanted to report a domestic dispute and described a white van with a Florida license plate. The rest of the call exchange was as follows. The caller says, quote, I'm right on the corner of Main Street by Moonflower, and we are driving, and I'd like to report a domestic dispute. A white van, Florida license plate, white van. The police then ask for details. Quote, as we drove by him, a gentleman was slapping the girl, the caller says. The dispatcher says he was slapping her? Yes, and then we stopped. They ran down and then up the sidewalk. He proceeded to hit her. Then they hopped in the car and they drove off. They made a right onto Main Street from Moonflower. Now, a completely separate witness would later describe other parts of the Moonflower incident in a statement to police that said that Petito and Laundry were talking aggressively and that Petito was punching Laundry in the arm. The witness said it looked like Laundry was trying to leave without Petito, but that Petito eventually climbed in through the driver's door and slid over into the passenger side as they began to drive away. The police then responded and conducted a traffic stop of the van near the entrance to the Arches National Park, and they found Petito crying in the passenger seat. On officer body cam footage, she told the officers that she was struggling with personal issues. She said, quote, we've been fighting all morning. He wouldn't let me in the car before. He told me I needed to calm down. She went on to tell the officer that they had been arguing over her excessive cleaning of the van, telling the officer that, quote, some days I have really bad obsessive compulsive disorder and I was just cleaning and straightening up and I was apologizing to him saying that I'm so mean because sometimes I get frustrated. Now, later, Petito's father would say that she never had been diagnosed with OCD and must have just been using it as a slang term. The body cam footage from a separate officer showed that Petito first downplayed the physical altercation, but after the officer points out marks on her arm and face and tells her to just be honest, she tells him that Laundry quote, kept telling me to shut up and, quote, grabbed my face. She then showed the officer a cut or a bruise that she had on her arm and said that it burned. Petito then admitted that she had hit Brian first and asked the officers not to arrest or separate them. The officer then sat Petito in the back of his patrol car before moving on to talk with Laundrie. Brian Laundrie also said that they had been arguing and that emotional tension had been building due to their close quarters and traveling together for four to five weeks. Laundry stated that Petito had struck him because she was concerned that he was going to leave her alone and stranded after he got into the van. In the video, Laundry said, quote, she gets worked up sometimes. I try to distance myself from her. I locked the car. He also said, let's take a breather. He said that she had her phone, and he said he was trying to push her away and saying, let's take a step back, Ultimately, that was how she got the marks on her arm and on her face. He said he was just trying to push her away when those injuries occurred. In addition, police reports from Officer Eric Pratt and Officer Daniel Robbins contain the following relevant statements. 
quote, at no point in my investigation did Gabrielle stop crying, breathing heavily, or compose a sentence without needing to wipe away tears. The officers wrote that, quote, the male tried to create distance by telling Gabby to take a walk to calm down. She did not want to be separated from the male and began slapping him. So he grabbed her face and pushed her away. The report also noted that neither Petito nor Laundrie wanted to press charges as a result of the incident. So the police arranged for Laundrie to spend the night at the Bowen Motel in Moab and for Petito to stay in the van. Officer Daniel Robbins wrote in his report, quote, After evaluating the totality of the circumstances, I do not believe the situation escalated to the level of a domestic assault as much as that of a mental health crisis. Each had their own cell phones in case of emergency. No charges are to be filed. Now, people are questioning why the police didn't treat the incident like a domestic violence situation. We do have a caller who said they saw Laundry slapping Gabby, and we saw the bruising to her arm, which, you know, Brian claimed was somewhat in self-defense. We also, on the other side, have a caller saying they saw Gabby punching Brian, and she readily admitted that she slapped him. In domestic violence situations, officers are trained to arrest the primary physical aggressor, which in this case, it is not entirely clear which one it would be, but it was probably Gabby. And, you know, quite frankly, taking Gabby to jail would serve no real purpose. You can tell by looking at the two, she isn't going to hurt Brian. So having them separate for the night and making sure that Gabby had her cell phone, it accomplished the same basic cooling off period that putting one of them in jail for the night would have accomplished. And you can do that without issuing criminal charges to one or both of them, which clearly neither one of them wanted. So while you can armchair quarterback the law enforcement handling of this situation, and obviously had they known that Gabby would be murdered a couple of weeks later, they might have responded differently. But given what they knew at the time, they did exactly what you would expect any reasonable officer to do. The next day is August 13, and presumably the two meet back up and mend fences. We don't know the specifics of the encounter or exactly what transpired over the next couple of days, but on August 17 of 2021, we know that the couple was about four hours north of Moab in Salt Lake City, Utah, where Brian Laundry flew from to Tampa, Florida. According to the Laundry family attorney, Stephen Bertolino, Laundry flew home to obtain some items and close a storage unit to save money as they contemplated extending the road trip. Laundry returned on August 23rd to rejoin Petito in Salt Lake City. And according to staff, Petito stayed at the Fairfield Inn and Suites near Salt Lake City International Airport that evening with Brian Laundry. On August 24, Petito's mother said that her daughter had told her they were traveling from Salt Lake City to Yellowstone National Park and that she had received a FaceTime call from Gabby stating that they were in the Grand Teton National Park in northwestern Wyoming. That's about 10 miles south of Yellowstone and about four hours or so north of Salt Lake City. On August 25th, there are multiple texts between Petito and her mother sent from the Tetons. Also on this date, the final post was made to Petito's Instagram account where she posed in front of a butterfly mural outside of a restaurant in Ogden, Utah which is between Salt Lake and the Tetons. So this pic would have been taken the day before. On August 26, there were more texts between Petito and her mother, during which her family believes she remained in the Tetons. August 27, a Louisiana couple vacationing in Wyoming claimed that between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m., they saw Laundry and Petito together at the Mary Piglets, which is a Tex-Mex restaurant in Jackson Hole, which is just southwest of Grand Teton in Wyoming. Per the witnesses, Laundry had an argument with the manager and staff about money, and he was aggressive. After he left, witnesses say they saw Petito come back into the restaurant crying and apologizing for Laundry's behavior. Restaurant staff have since confirmed that Laundry and Petito were indeed at the restaurant that afternoon, 
but they did not elaborate on the incident and stated that they did not have any surveillance video of the exchange. Of note, this would be the last time that we know of anyone other than her killer would ever see Gabby Petito alive. And this is also where the social media internet sleuths picked up the trail. Because of social media participants, we know where they went when they left Mary Piglets. The operators of an RV YouTube channel posted GoPro dash cam footage they captured from later in the evening on August 27th. It showed a white van matching the description of the one Petito and Laundry had been driving. The video was from the Spread Creek Dispersed Camping Area of the Bridger Teton National Forest. This area is about an hour's drive from the restaurant. And so here's how that went down. Well after the date in question, Jen and Kyle Bethune, YouTubers with a family travel vlog known as Red, White, and Bethune, spotted Petito's van in their video while they were editing footage shot in the Grand Teton National Park. The footage shows a white van parked at the side of the road in the park's Spread Creek Dispersed Camping Area. Now, in connection with the footage uploaded with their YouTube video, the Bethunes wrote this, quote, We were editing our video tonight, and we were looking at footage from August 27, 2021, around 6 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. in the Spread Creek Dispersed Camping Area. We had passed by a white van with Florida plates. We noticed it because we are originally from Florida. When we passed, all the lights were off and it didn't look like anyone was there. And at the time, it was just a meaningless Florida van. But what's wild is that the Bethunes explained that their GoPro camera had accidentally been left on. It was recording out the front of the RV as they drove through the area. Now, Spread Creek is a series of long dirt roads in the middle of nowhere, so there's really nothing to record, and the GoPro wasn't even supposed to be on as they were driving through the camping area. So, several days later, when they were going back through footage, editing for their channel, they then recognized the van in the footage as the same one they had seen on the news about the missing girl. They immediately realized that it could be helpful in the search for Petito, and they gave it to the FBI, who, as we now know, would locate her remains in this exact area about three weeks later. Now, August 27 was also the day that the odd text messages from Gabby's phone started. A text was sent to her mother that said, quote, Can you help Stan? I just keep getting his voicemails and missed calls, end quote. Now, the text raised concerns for Petito's mother, who said that Stan is Gabby's grandfather, but that Petito had never referred to him by his first name. Moving on to August 28th, another witness would later report to the FBI the activities of a slow-moving white van and a young white male acting weird on August 28th near the Spread Creek Dispersed Camping Area. His activities were odd enough that she posted a video to TikTok about her observations. And according to the FBI, the location of her accounts of laundry were consistent with the location of where authorities ultimately found Gabby's body. August 29th of 2021. A woman would later publicly claim in a series of videos also posted on TikTok that said that she and her boyfriend picked Laundry up on August 29th while he was hitchhiking in the Coulter Bay area. And that's about 20 minutes away from where they found Gabby's body. Miranda Baker stated that they picked him up at around 5.45 p.m. Laundry told them that he had been camping by himself for multiple days at a site outside the Grand Teton National Park near Snake River while Petito was back at their van working on social media posts. However, once Laundry found out that Baker and her boyfriend were going to Jackson Hole instead of Jackson Proper, he got agitated, asked to stop the vehicle, and got out near the Jackson Dam. 
It was just after 6, 10 p.m. From there, Norma Jean Jalovic, a seasonal Wyoming resident, told CNN that she picked up laundry near the Jackson Dam and gave him a ride to the Spread Creek Dispersed Camping Area. Jalovic said that she picked him up around 6.30 p.m., which was just a few minutes after Baker had dropped him off. According to Jalovic, Laundry told her that he and his fiance had a travel blog she was in their van at the camping area working on the blog and that he had been hiking along the Snake River embankment for the last few days. Jalovic said that when they arrived at Spread Creek, Laundry requested that she drop him off at the entrance of the camping area. She said that she offered to take him further and to his specific campsite, but that he was insistent that he be dropped off at the entrance. It was 6.50 p.m. Laundry then offered her gas money, but she declined and drove away. So there stood Brian Laundry at the entrance of the campground, which as we now know was still several miles from the location of Petito's van. So we know for sure that Laundry is in the Spread Creek camping area at 7 p.m. on August 29th. And we also know for sure that he will be back in North Point, Florida by 10.30 a.m. on September 1st. That is a 2,400-mile trip that takes 35 hours, according to Google Maps. Not the kind of a drive you take on a whim. So the criminal defense lawyer in me posits that Gabby is already dead at this point that earlier in the day, Brian had hid her body in the wilderness, and then he took a short hike out to the road where he was picked up near Coulter Bay by Miranda Baker. I believe that Brian was hitchhiking back to the van and attempting to establish an alibi along the way. Remember his Snake Creek story that he told to both of the people who gave him a ride. And autopsy reports are consistent with Gabby's death occurring at or near this time period, which makes what happened on the next day even more eerie. That's August 30th. The last text message from Gabby's phone was sent, which read, quote, no service in Yosemite. Her mother, Nicole Schmidt, would later express uncertainty about who sent the message and would later say that she did not believe this text was actually written by Petito. On September 1st, Laundry returns home alone in Gabby's white van. A license plate reader on the turnpike photographed the vehicle exiting Interstate 75 into Northport at 10.26 a.m. Eastern Time. The van would later be recovered by police at the Northport, Florida home of Christopher and Roberta Landry, Brian's parents. As I mentioned before, that's a hell of a trip to drive basically straight through. And remember, Landry told Jalovic that his fiance was in their van at the camping area working on the travel blog. If Landry had returned to the van and found Gabby missing, he would not have immediately just have driven home in her van. He would have at least stuck around to see if she returned, or he would have looked for her or reported her missing. He would have done something, not just immediately hit the road for 35 hours. So the reality is that most likely Gabby was dead by August 29th and that Brian Laundry knew it. So in between September 1st and September 5th, Gabby's family begins to worry because they have no contact with her. On September 6th, of 2021, the Laundry family goes to a campground about 75 miles away from their home in Florida. Roberta Laundry, Brian's mother, checks in at a waterfront site at the Fort DeSoto campground, according to the park's check-in report. The Laundries were at the campground from September 6th to September 7th, and then they all left together. Cassie Laundry, Brian's sister, would later say that she had no idea Gabby was even missing during this camping trip. On September 11th, and after not being able to get in touch with her for several days, Petito's family, who lives in New York, remember, reports Gabby missing to local police and files a missing persons report. They specifically refer law enforcement to Brian Laundrie, who was ignoring their text and calls for information about Gabby. 
So New York law enforcement then contacts Northport authorities who go to the laundry home that night and ask to speak with him and the family. They are told to, quote, speak with their attorney. On September 13 of 2021, Brian Laundry leaves his family home in Florida to go on a hike at the Carlton Reserve in Venice, Florida. His parents later told police that he left home with a backpack, but it would also later be determined that he left that day without taking his cell phone or his wallet, although some do speculate he had a burner phone with him. But this would be the last day that anyone would see Brian Laundrie alive. On September 14, police seize the van from the Laundrie's family home to search for additional evidence. Crime scene technicians found an external hard drive that was later examined as part of the search warrant. On September 15, Laundrie is named a person of interest. Laundry's parents continue to refuse to speak to police or to the Petito family on advice of counsel who has advised them to remain silent. On September 16, Petito's family attorney reads a letter from the family at a news briefing held by police where the family begs the Laundry family to help in the investigation. Quote, please, if you or your family have any decency left, please tell us where Gabby is located. Tell us if we are even looking in the right place. All we want is for Gabby to come home. Please help us make that happen. We haven't been able to sleep or eat and our lives are falling apart. The attorney noted that Petito's family had reached out to the Laundries earlier in the month for information about Petito's whereabouts, but the Laundries refused to provide any information. After several days of both Petito's family and the police pleading with Laundries family to cooperate in the investigation, the Laundries request the police to come to their home, where they share that they haven't seen Brian Laundry since September 13th. Bertolino, the Laundry family attorney, would later tell CNN, quote, the whereabouts of Brian Laundry are currently unknown. The FBI is currently at the laundry residence, removing property to assist in locating Brian. As of now, the FBI is looking for both Gabby and Brian. On September 18th, Northport Police announced that law enforcement is conducting a search for Brian Laundry in the 25,000-acre Carlton Reserve. It's a nature area with more than 80 miles of hiking trails in Venice, Florida. Roughly 50 law enforcement officers from five local agencies and the FBI start searching for laundry. Day one and day two of the search are in the Mayakahatchee Creek Environmental Park. This is a smaller 168-acre park within the overall larger 25,000-acre nature reserve. But law enforcement finds nothing, and so they move on. Meanwhile, the FBI announces that the agency and its partners are also conducting a search in Grand Teton National Park relative to Petito's disappearance. It was later determined that much of the information provided by social media participants would be very valuable in pinpointing search locations. On September 19 of 2021, human remains were found near Petito's last known whereabouts at the Spread Creek Dispersed Camping Area of the Bridger Teton National Forest in Grand Teton National Park, not far from where the van was previously observed. The preliminary results from an autopsy determined that the manner of death was homicide. FBI agent Charles Jones said in a news conference that human remains discovered in Teton County were consistent with the description of Petito. He went on to say that a full forensic identification has not been completed to confirm 100% that we have found Gabby, but her family has been notified. Of note is what piqued my interest in this story. So I'm sitting at home, I'm watching CNN, and I see an FBI agent that made the statements that I just shared with you. And I'm thinking, well, that guy looks like a guy I went to high school with, Charlie Jones. And then I read the bottom of the screen, and I'm like, well, I'll be damned. It is Charlie Jones. So the FBI agent who announced the discovery of Gabby Petito's body and I, we went to high school together in a little town 
called Nixa, Missouri, that had, you know, six or 7,000 people in it way back when. Now, obviously, Charlie can't give me any confidential details about the case, but man, small world. Way to go, Charlie Jones. But back to business. Now, September 20, the parents of Brian Laundry, Christopher and Roberta Laundry, are questioned at their home by the FBI as federal agents execute a search warrant. Authorities search the home for hours and tow the family's Ford Mustang from the driveway of the home. On September 21st, the Teton County Coroner confirms that the human remains found at the Bridger Teton National Forest are those of Petito. On September 22nd, the Sarasota County Sheriff's Underwater Recovery Force is called in to assist in the search at the Carlton Reserve. On September 23rd, the FBI in Denver announced that the U.S. District Court of Wyoming issued a federal arrest warrant for Brian Laundrie pursuant to a federal grand jury indictment related to Mr. Laundrie's activities following the death of Gabby Petito. They officially declared the search for Laundrie a manhunt at this point. The grand jury indictment specified one count of intent to defraud related to the unauthorized use of Gabby's Capital One debit card stating that Laundry used the card to obtain more than $1,000 between the dates of August 30th and September 1, and he did so without Gabby's consent. The FBI later returned to Laundry's home looking for material to match with Laundry's DNA. On September 25, Dog the Bounty Hunter joins the search. He was on his honeymoon with his sixth wife at the time, and so Dog takes a break from his honeymoon to search barrier islands looking for signs of Brian Laundry. Finding none after three or four days, he resumes honeymoon activities. On October 5, Laundry's sister Cassie gives an interview with ABC News stating, quote, I would tell my brother to just come forward and get us out of this horrible mess. And it was during this manhunt where internet sleuths were painting Laundry as a monster by highlighting his social media posts. And admittedly, some of these images on Pinterest were disturbing. In one post saved to a folder called My Heart, the words, quote, Don't try to find me. I have finally escaped my master's wicked clutches are written. Another one says, bite the hand that feeds you. Another post quotes the 1999 movie Fight Club. Quote, it's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything. And perhaps the most concerning post featured a headstone with, quote, my baby inscribed on it. The image also contained the words, she'll never find a sweet man like me. On October 12th, we have the coroner's report. It stated that after a detailed investigation by forensic pathologists with the assistance from the FBI, Petito's manner of death was determined to be homicide and the cause of death by manual strangulation, according to Teton County Coroner Brent Blue. The coroner says that Petito's body was outside in the wilderness for about three to four weeks prior to being found. When we compare that to what we know, we know she was alive on August 27th because she was seen by witnesses at the Mary Piglets. We also know she was dead by August 29th because that was the night that Laundry was hitchhiking around before he drove home. Gabby's remains were found on September 19th. It looks like the body was in the wilderness right at three weeks, which would be consistent with the coroner's findings. On October 19, Brian Laundrie's parents call law enforcement and alert them that they want to personally search the Myakkahatchee Creek Environmental Park. Recall that this is the smaller 160-acre park within the larger 25,000-acre nature reserve, and this is where the search initially began. On October 20, authorities conduct the search with the laundry parents and discover human remains and personal items, a backpack and a notebook belonging to Brian Laundry, just off of a park trail. And although the area had previously been searched by law enforcement, they stated that the exact area was until just recently underwater. That night, Laundry family attorney tells several news sources that the family believes the remains are that of Brian Laundry. Now, this sequence of events raises more questions than it answers. Like, how long did they know he was there? 
Did they know all along, or did they stumble across maybe a note that Brian had left? And why reveal this information now? All great questions. Ultimately, we will have to wait for a formal coroner's report as to the cause of death. But as we sit here today, it appears that this case is over. So the takeaway from all of this, if there's anything positive in this entire mess, it is the amount of media coverage was cited by some commentators as an example of the missing white woman syndrome or the overemphasis of news about individuals who are young and pretty and affluent and white to the exclusion of all others. So this case really put a spotlight on that epidemic. But kudos to Petito's parents who have been advocating for the public to aid authorities in finding other missing persons, specifically hundreds of missing people who are indigenous to Wyoming. But at the end of the day, hopefully the positive takeaway from this is that the increased interest in the Petito case has led to increased awareness of other missing person cases in the United States. So that's the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button for me. If you got something to say, you got a question, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button and subscribe to the channel. And last but not least, you guys know that I love it when you share me on social media. That's all for today. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money. 